Hello and welcome back to Columbia University Physics Preceptor TV. Today we're going to talk about experiment 28. It's the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect was pretty much the birth of quantum mechanics as we know it. In fact, Einstein was his, won his Nobel Prize for his work on the photoelectric effect. Uh, he's most, mostly well known by, um, because of his discovery of relativity. However, it's for the photoelectric effect that he won his Nobel Prize. And before we actually start talking about the experiment itself, I want to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics, just for a couple of minutes, just to get you guys excited about what you're about to discover. So apparently quantum mechanics is so weird that it's gotten, it's, it cannot be classified as classical physics. Even Einstein's theory of relativity, which I think is weird, still is considered classical physics. That's how strange and uh, absurd quantum mechanics is. So some of the predictions that quantum mechanics um, has is that particles, instead of having to be in one place at any given time, can actually be in two places at the same time. Also, instead of just moving to the right or just moving to the left, a particle in quantum mechanics can move to the right and the left at the same time. Now, this only really works for small, tiny particles like electrons or photons, subatomic sub, uh, sub, sub uh, particles. Uh, so you, you shouldn't expect this to happen with anything like a chair or anything like that. So quantum mechanics is pretty much only valid for, uh, for small, small particles. Another thing that quantum mechanics predicts that I think is particularly strange is if you have two locations, A and B, and you have a particle that travels from A to B, you only know, know that it starts at A and it ends with B, from B. So suppose there's some black box here, and I throw a ball through the black box, and you see it land on the other side. Now you saw where it started and you saw where it ended, and then from classical physics, physics, you can determine exactly what the trajectory of the, of the ball was. Now, if this had been an electron instead of a macroscopic ball, in fact, we couldn't have simply determined which path it took. In fact, it wouldn't have just taken one path. It would have taken two paths or three paths. In fact, it would take every possible path from A to B at the same time. So it would travel three times around the moon and then over to B, and it would travel back and forth to the Andromeda galaxy 15 times and then to B, all different paths at the same time. That's another twisted prediction of, uh, of quantum mechanics. So let's get into exactly what the photoelectric effect is all about. Um, suppose that you have a metal. So inside this metal you have a bunch of electrons, and they can move around pretty freely. But in order to pick one of these electrons up, you have to give it a little bit of energy. It's kind of bound to the metal. So let's suppose you have to give the electron an energy W. And this W then depends on what type of metal it is, you know, if it's you know, iron or if it's sodium, it's whatever, whatever type of um, uh, substance this, this is. Then if, if I could somehow give this electron energy, it can pop out of the surface. And then we can see free electrons up here. So the idea of the photoelectric effect is that in, in, in order to give this ener uh, electron energy, we in fact have a ray of light that we bombard onto this metal. And when we do that, that's how we give the electron energy so that it can jump up. Now, we can imagine that if we shine red light on a metal and we don't see any electrons pop up, maybe we just have to put twice as much light on there. So we bring out another red flashlight and we you know, bombard it with more and more light and eventually we'd imagine that if we have sufficient amount of light incident on the metal that these electrons would in fact be ex excited and be seen free up here. So that's a prediction of classical physics. And it was very surprising when people realized that that wasn't at all the case. It didn't depend at all on how much light you were, you were, that was incident on the metal. Instead, the only thing that seemed to matter was the color. So if this was red, it didn't matter how much red light you put on there, you would perhaps never see any electrons on, uh, jump off the metal. However, if you had blue light, even with perhaps the most minute amount of light, you could still see electrons fall off. So that was one of the stunning things that classical physics could not um, predict, which is why um, the photoelectric effect was the birth of quantum mechanics. So in fact, suppose that, uh, what, well, actually, that one of the predictions of quantum mechanics is that the energy stored in light is some constant called Planck's constant times the frequency of that light. So you see that as the frequency increases, the energy in the light increases. So it, knowing this formula, it's not that surprising that red light, which has a low frequency, 
may not be able to excite electrons, whereas blue light, which has a large frequency, may in fact be able to do that. So suppose that you have some light of frequency f incident on this metal. The electrons first need um, an amount of energy w to even get off the surface. So once they get off the surface, the amount of energy they have is then this energy that's incident in the form of light minus this work function. So once they're up here, the energy is um, uh, hf minus w. In fact, you can imagine that you could have less energy. You know, you could bounce into stuff on the way and lose more energy. So this should really be the maximum energy. The maximum energy that an electron can have up here is hf minus w. So if we could, in fact, measure the energy as a function of the frequency, what we would get, according to this quantum mechanical description, would be a straight line. It would look something like this. It would have a negative uh, intercept on the y-axis, or on the energy axis, which is minus w. And it would have a slope, which according to this formula is Planck's constant h. This is exactly the experiment we're going to do today. We're going to measure the energy as a function of frequency and determine the slope and the intercept. The way we're going to do that is we're going to put this, photo, this metal that uh, participates in the photoelectric effect inside a circuit. So over here on the left, we have a variable potential, V. And then here we have a resistor with a resistance R. And here is this entire machinery that, that's involved in the photoelectric effect. This is that metal that I drew before. It has a bunch of free electrons on it with some work function. And what we're going to do is to shine light of some frequency f here onto this, uh, this plate so that we can excite electrons off of it. Suppose at first that we had no potential V here, so that the V was basically 0. Then as soon as we have these free electrons, they would start traveling over to the other side here. And then eventually we would see a current flowing through the circuit. Now as we start increasing V, since electrons in this circuit with the, this polarization of the potential want to flow in the counterclockwise direction, if we set these free here, eventually at some critical potential, they're going to decide to turn around. If V is sufficiently small, they may sell, still decide to make it over to the other side. But if V is sufficiently large, they're going to turn around and, make, and not make it over to the other plate. And as such, we're not going to see any current anymore. This critical potential where this occurs is called the stopping potential. And it's indicated by V and then a subscript S. Now, what exactly happens in here to make sure that these electrons turn around? Well, the electrons, like I said before, once they, ha once they leave this first plate, they have some kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is given by this HF minus w. Um, but if we have this potential here, they're going to have to climb up a potential barrier. And at this critical potential, when they barely make it to the other side, the amount of potential uh, energy they're going to have to have over here would be the charge of the electron E times the potential Vs. So at this critical point where you see no more current in here, we know that the electrons charge times Vs, in, in fact, is equal to this uh, maximum energy. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to uh, measure this Vs, the stopping potential, for various um, frequencies. And this, once we know the stopping potential, we can determine the kinetic energy, or the maximum energy. This is the same thing as I called E max before. And once we know E max from Vs, we can make that simple graph of the energy versus the frequency. Now, it turns out that the currents that you get in, in this type of circuit are sufficiently small that it's not really a good idea to measure the currents. Instead, we're going to measure the potential across this resistor. Now, if there is a current, then you'll lose some potential across this resistor. So you'll see that these points, I think they call them A and B, are going to be different potentials. However, if there's no current, then there's no potential drop across the resistor. So these two points will be at the same potential. So. We're going to do this by attaching a little magic box across this resistor, which is an amplifier. And then it's going to be attached to a meter that we can read. If I recall correctly, it's called a 505 meter. 
Now, at the same time, we have to have some way of measuring the potential v. And uh, we do that by basically attaching a voltmeter across this battery. So this is the diagram that they have in the book uh, with the amplifier and uh, the 505 meter and the 303 meter. So this takes care of the potential, um, the stopping potential, and this thing measures when the current is zero. When this thing reads zero, that means that there's no potential drop across the resistor, and in such, there's no current flowing in the circuit. So, um, in order, the, the other tricky thing to do here is to determine the incoming frequency f. What is this frequency? Well, instead of having different colored lights shining on here, we have a mercury lamp, and unlike regular regular light that we see, which is pretty pretty continuous, has pretty much all the colors in it. Uh, a mercury lamp, lamp only lets out certain frequencies. So if we graph the wavelength on the x-axis, um, we see that only certain frequencies are emitted. Then I think they call them A, B, C, D, and E in the book. That's what these vertical lines are, are to represent. So suppose that this is a lamp here. It's shining. Then. If, this, um, if we're looking at this uh, metal over here that we're interested in, we're going to put a film in between that has a certain color. And it only lets through certain colors so that by, by putting very different filters in between, we can control which frequencies reach this, um, this metal plate. So there are four different filters. And let me see if I can get this pretty accurate. It looks something like this. You have filter 22, filter 77, uh, filter 18A, and filter 47B. Now, if we look at filter 18A, we see that the only uh, wavelength that the lamp produces in that, in that range that the filter lets through, it only lets through these, these wavelengths. And the higher it is, the more it lets it through. So these wavelengths, it barely lets through. It doesn't let these through at all. And the maximum it lets through is at this particular wavelength. So apparently, the only wavelength that the uh, mercury lamp emits in this range is wavelength A. So if we put in filter 18A in here, that means that basically uh, wavelength A is the one that comes out on the other side and the one that it, um, is incident on this metal surface. Now, certain other ones are a little more complicated, and I encourage you to think about this, um, which colors are always let through. The only thing that you should be concerned with is that since we're concerned about the stopping potential, we only, always need to worry about the most energetic electrons. And the most energetic electrons are created by the most energetic light. So if there are, seem to be two different uh, frequencies that are let through by uh, pretty much the same amount, then you always should go with the most energetic light. And remember that this is a graph of the um, wavelength, so that a larger wavelength, in fact, means a less energetic light. Uh, that's pretty much all the comments I have about the experiment. Good luck and have fun.